<laughs> Hello, everybody. Uh, my name's David Miles. I'm a professor of economics here at Imperial College. I've been at Imperial, well, on and off for quite a long time. I say on and off. I've spent most of the last six or seven years on a sort of extended leave from Imperial at the Bank of England, where I was on their monetary policy committee. That's the committee that meets every month or so and decides what level of interest rates there should be in the UK. But I came back, having done my six and a bit years on that, I came back to Imperial uh, just over a year ago now, 18 months ago, and have resumed an interest in the topic which I'm assuming you folks are interested in because you're here on a Saturday afternoon at five o'clock, which is the housing market in uh, major economies. I'm going to focus not just on the UK, although I'm going to talk a lot about the UK, and I'm going to talk quite a lot about London, actually, but I want to broaden out the subject and actually look at trends in housing markets across a range of different countries. Because I think that when you're looking toward the future and what might happen over many decades as you look into the future, actually looking at the, the lessons of history and what's happened in different countries is a pretty useful thing uh, to do. So there's my title, How Much Will a House Be Worth in 100 Years? There probably aren't too many people in the room here who will be alive in 100 years. Although life expectancy has gone up a lot, it hasn't gone up quite that much. Um, but I think it's a question, if you're focusing on a horizon like 100 years, that most of us are still actually pretty interested in. Because children or grandchildren, many of whom are not yet uh, are, are around, um, many of them will be alive in 100 years, and one wonders about what the world will look like. Will they be able to afford housing? And that's really the question that I want to focus on this afternoon. Um, let me just ask a quick question. How many, how many people, quick show of hands, how many people own the house or flat apartment in which, in which they live? Yeah, quite a high, quite a high proportion. Um, can I ask, what purport, how many people own the house or flat they live in in London, inside the M25. Lucky people, <laughs> especially if, they bu if you bought uh, a few years ago. How, let me ask another final question. How many people have bought for the first time, as a first time buyer, a property in London within the M25, say, um, within the last five years? Not many, not many. Maybe not surprising, um, given what has happened to the value of housing in London over the last 10, 15 years or so. This chart is a measure of the ratio in London between uh, average earnings, average earnings of a single person who's working, uh, and the average price of a house in London. So if you go back 20-odd years, kind of mid-1990s, that ratio was around about... It's a bit difficult to read it here from the front. My neck's hurting already. Um, around about 6. 20, at the end of 2014, it was about 16. Right now, it's about 18. So in a 20-odd year period, not much more than 20-odd years, house prices relative to average earnings uh, have gone up threefold. Uh, that's pretty extraordinary. And part of the question I want to focus on is whether or not that sort of thing can continue. Can house prices stay as expensive relative to people's incomes, both in London and for the UK more generally, can they stay as expensive as they are right now? Or are we in something that's obviously unsustainable, it's a bubble, things are just not affordable, people can't get into the housing market, that can't be sustainable, prices are going to have to fall back. Or might the next 30, 40 years actually look a bit like the last 30, 40 years with house prices continuing to do what on average they've done for some time now, which is go up faster than people's earnings. And you might think, plausible first reaction to that question might be, well, of course, that can't happen 
because that just it must be unsustainable. How could, how could that continue? Um, focusing just a minute on London, and I'm, I'm going to spread out from talking about London to then talking about some information on the UK and then looking at the whole world. But let's just stay with London just for a moment. What this chart shows is in different boroughs of London, and many of you will recognise um, the names of most of these blocks here. People from outside London um, might recognise a few, a, few, uh, a few less. But what we're doing now is we're measuring the average house price in that borough relative not to somebody who earns the average income, but somebody who's quite a long way up the income distribution, somebody at the 70th percentile. So that's somebody whose income is higher than 70% of the people in that borough. And there's only 30% people in that borough who are earning more than them. So this is not to the average person. This is a relatively well-off person. And you can see some of those ratios there. Brent is almost 10. Camden is 13. Islington's about 11. Hackney, about 10. Let's go south of the river. Wandsworth, about 10. Uh, Lewisham is a bit lower, about 8. Lambeth is close to 10. There's three that are blanks there. City, Westminster, and Kensington. That's because the ratios are considered somewhat unreliable for those areas. House prices are so high, and actually there's quite a lot of people who, don't, who, don't, who aren't in the labour force, who are not working in those boroughs, maybe because you have to be quite old and retired to have accumulated so much wealth to be able to live in those areas. But the ratios there are rather unreliable. On some measures, they're like 30 or 40. And again, this is not somebody on average earnings. This is somebody who's quite a long way up the earnings distribution. It's not just a London phenomenon. Um, this chart shows a slightly different measure. This is now how much people are borrowing relative to their earnings on average in order to purchase houses. So again, if we go back 20, 30 years, maybe 30, 40 years, that was around about on average double. So some people needed, some people had quite a large deposit. They were second-time buyers, and they, maybe they didn't need to borrow a great deal. Other people might have been borrowing three, four times their earnings. The average was about two. Now that average in London is getting toward three and a half, getting up toward four. And for the UK as a whole, which is the blue line, it's a bit lower, but it's not that much lower. And in fact, that reflects the fact that house prices, not just in London, but across much of the UK, have been going up faster than earnings for quite a considerable period. An implication of which is that people need to borrow much more on average relative to their earnings to get into the housing market. I said I wanted not just to focus on London and not just on the UK and actually look at long periods of history to get some clues as to what the future might look like. So what this chart shows is a measure of house prices, not relative to earnings anymore for this particular picture, but house prices relative to the price of other things, relative to the price of food and cars and electricity and clothes, a bundle of commodities, the average price of things people buy, and it's the price of houses relative to that. It's a pretty long period. It goes back to 1870, and it comes up pretty, pretty close to today. The last observation is about um, six or seven years ago, 2012. And this is an average across 14 large economies. The UK is in there. So is the US, France, Germany, Italy, Japan. All the sort of relatively big, rich economies in the world are in there. And this is a global average. And it's kind of an interesting picture, at least I think it's kind of interesting, because basically what happens between about 1870 and just after the Second World War, that line bobbles around a bit, but it starts out at that number 50 doesn't mean very much, just an index number. So 50 and goes up and it goes down a little bit, but by about 70, 80 years later, 1945, 1950 or so, it's about the same level. Sometimes it goes up, sometimes it goes down. But house prices didn't get, on average, across all these economies, house prices didn't get very much more expensive. In fact, they didn't get more expensive at all relative to the price of other stuff people were buying. The last 50 years have been very different. 
you can see that that line starts getting very steep in the 70s, it gets a bit steeper again in the 90s, and then very recently it's got very steep leading up to the financial crisis. The UK line has continued to go up after the end of this period, which is up to 2012. Basically, in the period since about 1950, 1960, so the last 50, 60 years or so, following 100 years where house prices did not go up faster than the price of other stuff, house prices have tripled. We've gone from an index number of about 50 to about 150. Why has that happened? Well, if you think about a house, a house is a combination of some land and some structure erected on it. Uh, one way of thinking about the rise in house prices is to see, well, what's gone up most then? Is it, is it largely because the cost of constructing houses has gone up very dramatically, faster than the cost of food and cars and clothes and computers and other stuff? Or is it that the land on which you build houses has gone up enormously in cost? And the answer is, it's largely land. So this is um, a measure of land prices, and it kind of looks pretty similar to the dotted line, which is the house price series. In fact, if we'd shown land which had planning permission to build on, the increase would be more dramatic than this particular chart, which is just farmland prices. So land has gone up and this is particularly true in the UK, land with planning permission, has gone up in price enormously. Construction costs, which is the um, darker of these lines here, has gone up a little bit. It's the same period, roughly, second half of the 19th century up to very recently. This is an average across 14 countries. The story for the UK wouldn't be very different. Construction costs, relative to the price of other stuff, has not, have, have not gone up very substantially, not very substantially. It's about land uh, prices. Uh, and I want to th think seriously about what that might mean when you come to think of the future. Clearly, one characteristic of land, as Mark Twain used to say, buy land, they're not making it like they used to. You can't make the stuff. I mean, you sort of can if you expend huge amounts of resources with landfill, you can increase the coastal, you can push the coast out a little bit. But effectively, the land mass of economies of countries is fixed. And that's not true, clearly, of the stuff you then use to construct houses on land. So if you think about bricks and glass and cement and even timber, I mean, this is stuff that's reproducible. And actually, you can produce it at pretty much a constant cost. So in thinking about what drives housing prices both in the past and into the future, I think drawing a distinction between the two key inputs into constructing houses, land essentially fixed, structure, buildings, the things you build, um, not fixed in quantity because we can expand or contract the amount of bricks and cement and glass that uh, are used to construct housing. So here are the questions I want to think uh, a little bit about over the next 20 odd minutes or so. Let's suppose we're in an economy where the population and what you might call labour productivity, how much people can produce at work, which on average over history has been rising, we're becoming more productive on average. Suppose you're in an economy where both those things grow at a steady rate into the future. Would we expect the value, the cost, the price of houses in such an economy that was growing at a steady rate to stabilize relative to incomes? So that that house price to income ratio, the thing that's been going up so much in London, so much in the UK, and indeed has been rising in many countries, should ultimately just stabilize at some level and the economy chug along with a steady ratio of house prices to incomes. Or, starting from the kind of levels we started in the UK, would we actually expect house prices to grow less than incomes over 
the next several decades so that housing becomes more affordable. Might we, could we imagine a situation in the economy where that ratio of house prices relative to incomes actually just continues going up and up and up? And if it does, what does that mean for the ownership structure of houses? If houses are going to become increasingly expensive relative to people's incomes, how are people going to buy houses? Will people just end up being in the rental sector of the economy for nearly all their lives, maybe just about to be able to afford a house when they get to their 60s and 70s and living it a, a, a short while because it's so expensive to buy houses and to save the deposit you need to enter the housing market may take years and years of your saving. Can you have an economy where the owner occupation rate continues to decline? These are some of the issues that a, a colleague of mine here at Imperial, James Sefton, uh, and I have been thinking about and trying to develop some economic models, some simplified models of how economies interreact, the savings decision of households, populations changing, land structure, land availability pretty much fixed, but able to create new structures relatively easily. How do all those things interact to drive housing costs in an economy over time. And any model, any model of that needs to be able to explain history as well. You wouldn't, you wouldn't trust an, a, a model of anything, of climate change, of um, brain patterns, or of how an economy evolves. You wouldn't trust a model if it didn't explain what had happened historically. And only if it can do that would you perhaps attach some weight to the predictions that model makes about what may be coming next. So I'm going to try and describe to you briefly, without using any, 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 any maths, um, how, how my colleague and I have put this model together. We thought that the answer to those questions, what may come next in terms of house prices relative to people's income and affordability and all that, is going to depend very sensitively on four factors in particular. More than four, but four seem to us very significant. Firstly, the technology of producing houses. If you think of a house as a combination of some land and a structure on it, that technology with which you combine land and structure clearly changes over time. And so how, how you combine land and structure seems to me to matter a, a great deal. And I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. Secondly, a question about people's preferences, our own preferences. How much are you willing to put up with living in a smaller, cheaper house in order to be able to consume stuff like cars and computers that become relatively cheap relative to housing? That's a question about your, your preferences. What is valuable to you in life? We can imagine a world in which people are very willing and happy to substitute away from consuming housing and consuming more cars, computers, overseas holidays, going out to nice restaurants if house prices just get high enough. You'll say, well, forget it. We'll live in a really modest, small place but we'll just go on fantastic holidays and have a supercar uh, and buy expensive clothes. The more people are willing to do that, the less house prices will go up. The converse is also true. The less people are willing to live in smaller, more modest accommodation as house prices go up in order to consume other stuff, the less willing people are to do that, and the more sacrifices they will make in terms of consuming less of other stuff in order to live in the house they've always wanted, then the more house prices are likely to go up. The third factor, which I think is pretty significant, is the nature of bequests. How is wealth transferred from one generation to the next? If people don't really have much interest in bequeathing wealth to their children or grandchildren, then house prices going up very fast means that they'll get to go on a wonderful binge 
late in life spend the value, the capital gains they've made on their housing, and the kids and the grandchildren are just basically on their own trying to save up enough to become homeowners themselves. If that's the way the world is, and I don't think that is the way the world is, but if that's the way the world is, then there's a more natural limit to how high house prices will go because children and grandchildren are kind of on their own when it comes to accumulating the resources needed to buy a house, and that puts a limit on how house prices can go. If, on the other hand, people routinely, as they move toward the end of their life, maybe they've paid off the mortgage, they live in the house, the apartment, think that that's what they want to leave to the next lot, that can help sustain extremely high house prices. And it's part of the answer to the question, well, how can house prices be so high relative to incomes? Well, they could be if people who are reaching the end of their life tend to bequeath a house to their children, or maybe they skip a generation and go to the grandchildren, which provides the spending power to allow house prices to stay very high. And in the work that um, I'm going to briefly describe to you that James Sefton and I have been doing, we make an assumption, which I think is a plausible one, that there is a good degree of bequeathing housing to children and grandchildren. And that's how what otherwise might look an unsustainable trajectory of houses getting more and more expensive relative to people's incomes may actually be sustainable. I'm not saying it's necessarily desirable, and there's some big issues there about inequality because not everybody has a parent or a grandparent who owns the expensive house. So there's a big distributional question there. But the assumption we've made in some of the work I'm going to describe to you is that there is a strong tendency of people, when they bequeath wealth to the next generation, to hand over largely unmortgaged property. That turns out to be pretty um, significant. I'm not going to focus too much on the mathematics of all this. We've kind of tried to build a model which integrates all these features. So we assume that people earn labor income at work. They have choices about how they use that income. They can buy consumer goods. They can spend some of the resources on housing costs, either rent or the interest you may have to pay on a mortgage uh, while you buy your own uh, where well, you pay for, 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 for the, the debt that you've taken out to buy the house. We assume the population evolves and grows gradually over time. We assume that people, on average, earn slightly higher real wages relative to the price of consumer goods through time. We also assume that there is a somewhat limited degree of substitutability between land and structure. And let me explain what I mean by that. Supposing I said to you, take the house you live in at the moment. Suppose you, 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 you live in a, a semi-detached house. It's got a little bit of a garden. It's got a plot size. It's two stories, ground floor, first floor. And I said to you, OK, look, um, I'll do you a deal. Give me half the land, and I'll compensate you by, although we'll chop your house in half, we'll build two stories onto it. So the floor space internally will be unchanged. Uh, it's just you've got less, you're just going to use less land. And I'll compensate you by throwing in 20% of what the house is currently worth. So the house is worth 300,000, let's say. I say, give me half the land. I'll build two more stories on your house, high quality build and I'll give you 20%, so I'll give you 60,000 quid as well. Would you do it? Actually, let me, let me just ask that question. How many, how many people would think that was a good deal and they would do that? Oh, a few. How many people think, nah, that's, that's not a good enough deal? Right, majority, okay. I'd say e economists try and work out from asking people questions like that and looking at market prices of housing, they try and work out how substitutable structure for land is. Okay? Your answers, most people think that's not a very good deal. I don't think it's a particularly good deal either, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't take that deal. 
by asking people questions like that and by looking at the prices for sale of different combinations of garden size and plot size and how many structures, how many floors houses have, economists try and work out how substitutable what you might call land and structure are in creating things we call units of housing. And it turns out that actually people don't really want to live in houses that have got a very small land area and have like maybe sort of six stories into the sky. People just don't particularly like that. Of course, there's a price at which you would do it. But you have to start reducing the price, the purchase price of the house a lot if what you do is you cut the land area and just build up or indeed go down. So that's one, that's one crucial factor in working out what the demand for housing looks like over time if you think that the land area is absolutely fixed and the population and average incomes of people is going to rise over time. Turns out that um, an American economist called Muth, Richard Muth, um, did quite a lot of investigation of the housing market in the US, particularly um, around where he was at university, which was Stanford, around San Francisco, um, some time back, trying to estimate this trade-off that people face between less land but maybe more structure, higher buildings, maybe even higher quality as well. Fantastic kitchens, marble on the floor, beautiful smoke glass, you know, all that kind of stuff. And he discovered, and many other people have, I think, found a similar thing, that there is a rather limited degree to which people will substitute away from land and be compensated by having more floors and fancier kitchens and better carpets and stuff. That turns out to be a really significant factor when you think about the long-run development of housing markets. I'm going to show you a bunch of charts now. Um, they're a bit small, actually. The only, one, the only ones I'm going to focus on, the only ones I'm going to focus on are these, these panels at the bottom left, the one which says house price to non-housing income. Basically, that line, we should think of that line, which in this particular chart goes up really very steeply, over a period running from zero to 200 years into the future. We should think of that line as essentially being house prices relative to average incomes in this model of the economy that has some of the features I've been describing to you. And this funny parameter, eta, 0.5, what does that mean? You think, well, what does that mean? I don't know what that means. That means a... a very limited degree to which individuals are willing to trade off footprint versus structure. Why does that matter so much? Well, it matters so much because imagine that structure, that's the cost of erecting the thing and using the bricks and the glass and the timber and the steel. The price of that doesn't particularly go up over time. That's kind of what one of the charts I showed you a little bit earlier, which was the construction cost of housing, actually doesn't wobble around very much. It's gone up a little bit, but actually not a big deal. So you've got one component into housing that probably doesn't increase in cost at all. And indeed, that's the assumption I make in some of these projections I'm going to show you over the next five minutes. But the other thing you need for housing is in completely inelastic supply, in the long run anyway. We could talk about planning restrictions which change the available amount of land to build on, but let's put that aside for one moment. The land mass of the economy is fixed. If you're in an economy where the population is rising and the incomes, the average incomes of people in the economy are rising and people will not substitute away from land toward having bigger structures willingly, that is a recipe for house prices rising over time and may well be rising faster than people's incomes. And that's what this panel, the bottom left-hand one, illustrates, which is the rather worrying conclusion that maybe the last 30 or 40 years in the UK and in many other countries, house prices going up faster than incomes, is something you better get used to because the next 200 years could look a bit like it. That line continues to go up 
as we look into the distant future. So the 200 number on the right, that's a 200-year simulation. Turns out that this, however, is very, very sensitive to this funny number, which I've set at a low level of 0.5. When I say a low level of 0.5, what I mean is that people are pretty reluctant to trade off smaller footprint and more floors. I'll live in a taller building, but you know, each floor will be pretty small. Maybe each floor becomes the size of one room, and I have 10 floors, as opposed to my two floors at the moment with five rooms on each floor. People don't seem to particularly relish that prospect. That's what a low number there, 0.5, means. It means that house prices may well continue to rise faster than incomes. However, if that degree of substitutability is somewhat higher. Now, you might say, what does 0.75 mean relative to 0 0.5? 0 0.75 is probably the few people in the room, when I outlined that deal earlier, I take half your house, I build another two floors on it, and I give you 20% of the value of the house, 60,000 quid as well. The people that put their hand up, the small number, who said, yeah, OK, maybe that's a good deal, they're probably a bit more like eta equals 0 0.75 people. And if that, on average, is what the economy looks like, it's full of people like that. Completely different shape line there, that bottom left-hand panel. Now, it sort of goes down gradually for about 100 years, then it turns around and starts going up again. So that would tell you that house prices relative to incomes, if you think of zero as today and 200 years where, where we are in the year 2217, we may be in for 100 years of very gradually declining house prices relative to incomes, and it turns around a bit. But you know what? 200 years from now, it's kind of back where it was. So it's, it's, it's really sensitive. These, th this kind of long horizon analysis of the housing market is very, very sensitive to this degree of substitute ability. I think there's a, there's a, there's a technological aspect to substitutability between land and structure as well. I've put it all in terms of, would you trade off having less space uh, and just have a taller building, that's all about your preferences. That's not particularly about technology. But on top of that, there's technological progress as well, which actually may make it much cheaper to build higher and to go lower and go underground. And that's, that's an aspect of the answer to this question as well. And I'll come back to that in, in my concluding comments in just a short while. I want to just illustrate one other aspect of this issue, which is the extent to which people may be willing, as if houses become more and more expensive, the extent to which people might be willing to say, well, look, OK, we'll just change our lifestyle. We'll live in a very modest property, pretty small, um, but we'll just go on a lot of holidays and stay in fancy hotels in other parts of the world and go on cruises and have a wonderful car, go out to restaurants a lot, go to the cinema, actually spend a lot of time not in our rather small little house. If that's what people do, what they're doing is they're substituting away from something that becomes increasingly expensive, housing, toward things that are relatively cheap relative to housing. Cars, computers, foreign holidays, going to fancy restaurants. The more people do that, there's a natural limit on how house prices will go. Because as house prices go, get bid, bid up even more, people just decide to demand less housing. But maybe they don't do that. That turns out to be super sensitive as well. That first picture, let's just go back a second. That first picture, the worrying one, house prices going up faster than incomes, far ahead as you care to look, was based on a particular degree of switching between spending your money on housing and spending your money on other things as house prices go up. I didn't pick an arbitrary assumption for that, but I used some historical evidence from many countries about what people actually do when house prices go up a lot. Do they go out to restaurants more and spend money on other stuff? Or do they do the opposite? They cut back on all those other things so that they continue to live in the kind of house that their parents lived in, even though it's much more expensive than when their parents bought it. That's putting it kind of rather starkly. So which end of the spectrum are we? 
I think there's quite a lot of evidence that we're somewhat nearer, somewhat nearer the, I'll cut back on spending money on other stuff just so I can pay the mortgage, the rent, save up for the deposit, buy the house I really wanted that's a bit like my parents' house. And that's what underlies that particular projection of the future there. But maybe the world will change a bit. Maybe people will become, young people will think, well, actually, why is the house so important? I'm going to spend a lot of time outside the house. I will go on those foreign holidays. I will have the nice car and have a fantastic sound system and a computer and all the rest of it. And so I'm not so hung up about living in a sort of rather large house. I'm going to substitute away from it. If we go with that assumption and increase to a relatively limited extent the degree to which people are willing to substitute away from expensive housing to consume other things, look what now happens to that bottom left-hand panel. Now house prices of the next 200 years don't go up as fast as people's incomes. These projections then are really sensitive to a couple of crucial characteristics of the economy. They're partly to do with technology. Can we really build cheaply things that are high? They're partly to do with preferences. Do people want to live a long way up in the air and save on land space by living on the 126th floor of a 1,500 feet high building? There's one final factor which, and I'm going to jump uh, on a little bit. Um, So what I've said is that there's a lot of sensitivity about projections of the future to these key, uh, these key features of the economy to do with preferences, but also to do with technology. I want to mention one other thing which I think is important. I, I, I said a while back, I said a while back that you wouldn't trust any model of the economy or indeed of any aspect of the world in which we live you wouldn't trust that model to predict reliably into the future if it didn't tell you something that matched up with what history looked like. And as yet, I haven't told you much about whether this economic model I've developed with my colleague actually is reliable in explaining what's happened in the past. I think it is, but then I would say that, wouldn't I? Um, but only if you add in one important factor. I said that the amount of land available is fixed, and I think that's true. But the amount of usable land may well not be fixed. What do I mean by usable land? Well, land, if land's going to be used to build houses, it better, be, it better be fairly near where those people want to be for much of their life, and that probably means near where they're going to work. There's a great deal of evidence that most jobs in economies now, and particularly high-paid jobs, are close to big urban centers. That's certainly true in the UK um, around London. It's true in the US around Los Angeles and Manhattan, where wages and availability of jobs is massively higher than somewhere like the Midwest. It's part of the reason why in the US, land in the Midwest is, I mean, literally dirt cheap. Um, real estate land around the center of Los Angeles, or particularly in Manhattan, is phenomenally expensive. Why don't people just live in the Midwest? Well, partly it's because that's not where the jobs are. And part of the reason that's not where the jobs are is that a lot of people who are high productivity, high income, people want to be near other people like that, and they tend to concentrate together. What do I mean by usable land? Well, usable land might be land where you could construct housing which is within commutable distance of these places where many of the jobs are. What is commutable distance? Well, that depends on transport technology. Transport technology for getting people to work in 1800 was basically walking. Some people had horses, but you know most people walked. That put a limit on how far you could live from the place it was that you worked. That's transformed, of course, during the 19th century by railways and buses and later on automobiles and constructing the road network. And people can live quite significantly further away from where they work. And in a sense, that is like increasing the usable quantity of land in an economy. So part of the work uh, I am describing you, uh, to you and part of the economic model that we've been de developing tries to look at how commuter speeds, transport speeds, have changed over time. 
and how that effectively is increasing the available land area of economies, or at least it did very dramatically between about the middle of the 19th century and about 1960, 1970, after which, in many economies, there's been very little improvement in average speeds that people travel at when they're getting into work, getting into the center of town. So there's an enormous improvement in the speed with which you can get into the center of cities between 1850 and about kind of the end of the Second World War, that slows down, and from about 1970 onwards, there's virtually no improvement. Let me jump on a couple of, oh, oh no, that's a disaster. No, it's not. Um, where's my nice chart? Okay. Okay, fine. So now look, now look at this left, the bottom left hand, the bottom left hand, okay? So now I go zero to 200. Now this is trying to explain the past. And what I've assumed here is based on average improvements in transport speeds, what that effectively did to grow the available land area that people could live on in economies. And I've assumed that for 100 years, which is roughly zero now becomes 1870. 100 becomes 1970. Roughly speaking, after 1970, in many economies, you just stop getting improvements in commuting speed. Probably in London, people commuting into London, the average speed at which people travel has gone backwards, actually, rather than just being flat. But across a lot of economies in the world, it's pretty much flat. What does that do to the projection in this model of how house prices should have evolved over the last 150 or so years? That's what the bottom left-hand panel shows. For about 100 years, 1870 up to about 1970, house prices actually fall a little bit relative to incomes. And then, once you no longer get an increase in the effective available land because commuting speeds have stopped improving, house prices begin to grow up sharp, go up sharply. That's pretty much the pattern I showed you many slides earlier, which was what has actually happened to house prices on average in the rich economies in the world between 1870 and 2012 or so. It showed, if you remember, roughly a flat line for 100 years, and then bang, starts going up very sharply. And the sharp period of, of increase more or less coincides with when people then have to just start moving out further and further and further from the center. And it becomes infeasible if you want to get to work in the same day and home again. Let me talk finally rather briefly before drawing some conclusions. And I won't, oh gosh, I'm running out of time. Um, about, about one aspect of that substitutability between land and structure, and that's technology. One of the things that's changed a lot in, in, in recent decades is the technology of building really tall buildings. So there's a kind of long quote there, and it says something roughly along the following lines, if you can't bother to read it. Uh, it basically, it says, look, when, when the Empire State Building is built in the US in 1930, whatever it was, 32, if any of you, have, you know, we've all seen pictures of the Empire State Building, maybe some of you have been up it. Um, it's got a huge footprint, it's a big block a whole block of sort of central Manhattan, midtown Manhattan, which is kind of the, the base of the building. And then it goes up, and, it, and eventually you get a tall tower in the middle. And the technology at the time meant that you just needed very big base to build something that was that high. Right now, in, uh, or at least for, for the last five years, they're building a lot of buildings in New York, which are, and I hope this thing is going to go. Oh, yeah, maybe. <coughs> Let's see if we can get this going. I'm going to try and stop this. So this is Manhattan. <coughs> there's some buildings going up there. Let's just stop it right there. Um, there's a couple of buildings that have gone up very recently that are kind of the same sort of height as the Empire State Building. The one on the left will be higher. That's 1,400 feet. Oh, that's nice. Um, and these are pencil-thin buildings. Their footprint is very small, and they can sort of go straight up. And that's partly because the technology of building very tall buildings has changed. So one thing that may kind of 
help us avoid the scenarios of house prices rising ever faster relative to incomes. It's just technological change, which means you can economize ever more on footprint and build higher and higher. Let me just run that forward a little bit because I think there's a few more buildings that are going to appear on this skyline. Right, so this is, these are some of the ones that are coming up in New York. And you can see these heights. They're kind of 1,500 feet, 1,400 feet, 1,000 feet. And they're super thin. They're super expensive at the moment, but the cost of building these things is, is coming down. Let me conclude, since I've run uh, uh, a little bit over. So, ooh, what am I doing here? Let's just shut that. Um, Let me draw some conclusions for all this. The bad news is that housing over the long term, which seems extraordinarily expensive in the UK at the moment, could, instead of becoming much cheaper, remain very expensive and possibly become even more expensive relative to people's incomes. That's going to be more likely if population and productivity grow steadily, people's real incomes rise and they want to live in nicer houses as they get richer, and the number of people who want to do that is rising if the population is going up. And it's been going up fairly steadily, fairly significantly in the UK over the last 15, 20 years or so. What makes house prices going up very fast is also um, an unwillingness to substitute structure for space or land footprint. So people may be very unwilling to go and live very high in the sky or a long way underground. The less willing they are to do that, that's also going to mean house prices will rise fast. And as we mentioned before, if people just aren't willing to substitute away from housing toward other things that become relatively cheap, going to the cinema, travel, um, that's also a recipe for house prices going up pretty quickly. And if there's no improvement in travel time, so that there is no escape from the logic of fixed land areas by just people living further away from where they may need to work and moving into areas of the country which are currently not at all densely populated, partly because it just takes too long to get from them at the moment to where people need to work. I think those conditions, A, B, C, Let's leave D to one side for a minute and, le and leave you with a, a, an optimistic thought. But I think A, B, C pretty much are true for the UK. That's one reason why something's happened that seems very unusual, which is for 20 or 30 years, house prices on average have gone up faster than people's incomes. The optimistic thought, and may maybe I'll stop on an optimistic uh, thought, is that although the land area is fixed, if we really get substantial improvements in transport technology, then it's not at all inevitable that houses become more expensive. Um, today, I came in from uh, Somerset, which is where I, uh, I live. Spend the middle of the week in London, but home for me is Somerset. Uh, that's about 140 miles west of London. Train took two and a half hours, and I needed to drive half an hour to get to the railway station and walk from the railway station here in London. So the whole thing took three and a half hours. I can't do that, go up and down in a day. That's seven hours traveling. It just doesn't work. You haven't got any time to work. You get to London, you say hello to your colleagues. I've got to leave now and turn around and go back again. If trains, instead of running at, on an average, it's 125 miles, it takes about two and a half hours on the train. The train's going at, you know, less, well, about 50 miles an hour. Supposing that train went at 150 miles an hour. Supposing it went 250 miles an hour. If it went 250 miles an hour, that train journey's half an hour. Add on a bit to get into the station, all the rest of it. Now it's an hour commute. That's doable. That would mean that rural Somerset, not densely populated at all, extraordinarily beautiful, become somewhere that's perfectly feasible for people to live and get to London if that's where their work is. So that seems to me to be the 
one aspect of the answer to the question, how might we avoid houses becoming increasingly expensive? I think it needs a massive improvement in transport infrastructure and speeds. Something we haven't seen in the past 50 years in the UK. We haven't seen it in that many countries. But maybe the next 50 years will be better. I leave you with that optimistic thought. I've been told, I think, that I shouldn't ask people what, for, for questions here because I'm, I'm going to go across, am I right? I'm looking at my colleagues at the back, yes. I'm going to go across to the wonderfully named contemplation area. Is that right? Yeah. Contemplation <laughs> area. Um, and I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll go over there right now. If people want to come and chat about this stuff and ask me questions or, or give me their thoughts, I'd be delighted to hear them. So I'll be across the way in just a minute. <laughs>